We all know that there is inherent dangers in life, but when you're entering into a contract, wouldn't it be nice to know if there's any hidden inherent dangers? It sure would be. You're listening to Wealth Talks with the McPhees. We're here in the studio this morning. We're going to be talking about the hidden dangers in certain life insurance contracts <laughs> and also in some other marketing practices that, you you know, this is not a common, this is not just something that happens in the life insurance industry. It happens in many other industries as well. We're going to look at some of those historical examples and unpack the wisdom and the, the information that we can learn from these examples to apply in other areas of life. So let's look at some of those uh, uh, examples that more of us might be familiar with so we can laugh about those and then maybe apply it in this area. And of course, we want you to get the wisdom and not be entrapped by the, uh, the, the fancy marketing that has been done in the insurance world as well as in other areas. We can look back to the 1950s when the t- the tobacco industry knew that their products caused cancer and uh, shortened life studies, uh, lifespans, and yet they continued to market and add more and more people to their addictive product. So uh, one of those was, uh, you know, the Marble Man that was introduced in 1955. And with the addition of the Marble Man, their products went up by 3,000%, their sell of their products. 30 times. Wow. So um, equivalent to today, that, that's about uh, $50 billion in sales. Wow. I remember growing up in the 70s and everybody had ash. Oh, we had ashtrays in our home. My parents didn't smoke, but we had ashtrays because people would come over. And there was no such thing as a, you know, later on they had smoking and non-smoking sections in a restaurant. Of course, the smoke always went to the non-smoking anyway. But there was early on, there was no such thing as smoking or non-smoking sections. Everyone just went in and people smoked. And, and most, of the t- most places today, except for maybe in casinos, there is no smoking in restaurants. In mm-hmm. fact, they don't even allow mm-hmm. them to smoke in buildings. Yeah, well, th- you know, things have changed quite a bit. And there, there would be a temptation almost to say, oh, look how far we've come past that. This is all part of history now. Now we're living in a totally different world. But that's not really the case, is it? It isn't. You know, uh, just recently, we've all lived through a pandemic. And uh, the marketing and the falsification of uh, data, just like the tobacco industry, there are um, hospitals, drug companies, the media, uh, personal protection product providers, that their profits have soared 78% off that false advertising. Wow. And that that actually competes with what Philip Morris did by introducing the Marble Man because the profits are just about in the same ballpark. Can we talk about just a few things out of the pandemic that, you know, we all say, oh, yeah, the pandemic and false advertising. But I like to go back and just remember just a few of those things. Well, you know, first of all, face masks didn't work. Then they did. Then double face masks. And now it's to the fact that they never did anything in the first place. Yeah. And I remember initially when I would go out shopping, I would see people in full hazmat suits. Yeah. And it was like, what is going on? And then face masks started appearing. And I remember Dr. Fauci, even in an interview, I saw him chuckle and he said, no, you don't have to wear face masks. And then... A few weeks later. <laughs> uh, actually, and a few months later, it was, well, maybe we really should be considering triple masking. Or the height of stupidity where you have to stay six feet apart from everybody until you get in the airplane seat and now you're sitting two inches from somebody and you can take your mask off to eat and drink. <laughs> yes, and they're not really yeah. forcing that six inch thing or six foot thing now. But I do know that recently when I flew, even going down the, um, what is it, when you're jet, going from the building the sky bridge. to yeah, the, yeah. the skyway or the jet, jetway, jetway or whatever they call it between the building and the plane, there are still signs that tell you to stay six feet apart for your safety. And then you get in the plane and, you know, you sit on each other. And, you know, maybe we're too close to really see the irony of all this stuff. But let's go back to the tobacco thing for a second. What about reach for a lucky instead of a sweet? (laughs) Or when you're smoking for two... Oh, and that was, for pregnant, that was for pregnancy. You should, yeah. When you're smoking for two during your pregnancy, you should 
Reach or Wednesday. more wow. Dr. Smoke Campbell's or ivory tips protect your lips. <laughs> these are all things that the tobacco industry used, and these are the exact same techniques that were used in the pandemic to scare people or to encourage people to do something. It was herd mentality. Let's herd these people the way we want them to. So so I can think of one. First, uh, we were supposed to wear masks to protect ourselves, and then we were supposed to wear them to protect others. Mm -hmm. uh, that reminds you of one of those marketing lines. And first we were to get vaccinated to prevent the disease, and then we were to prevent the, to spreading it from others. Right. And now we find out the vaccine actually doesn't work mm. for yeah. any of those things. And more concerns, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so these are things that we know. We already know that advertising uh, is trying to lead us down different paths, maybe not accurate paths, but maybe paths to sell either products or ideas. Yeah, that's correct. So, so, so we've so got problems. Yeah, so we've got problems in the tobacco industry. We've got problems with the recent pandemic. What about other areas? You know, all of this must be true in other areas. Oh, I know. I know one. Um, how about most of us, I think, would believe that it's better to eat... Um, you, that, that you shouldn't go to a fast food restaurant if you're looking for high nutrient value in your food. Sure. But what do we see on billboards and in it's commercials? It's better than butter. Oh, oh, now you're talking about margarine. Margarine's better than butter. Well, hmm. <laughs> okay, we're on fast food right now, Tom. <laughs> so... So those pictures that we see on billboards and what we're seeing on TV commercials, that doesn't look like the same product if you're to go through a fast food drive-in. No, and, drive -through. no, and the pancake syrup never looks like it does on the commercials because we're not using a fine mo uh, a grade of motor oil in, in our commercial when we're pouring it on our breakfast pancakes like yeah. they do in the commercial. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it just doesn't have the viscosity or the flow or the glow as it does in the commercial. Let's so, get to the pictures, though. Yes. And and it's easier to sell the hamburger on the billboard than what you actually receive. And you all see all the smiles and the happiness of all, surrounding all those people having a wonderful burger and fries. And that that's not to say we can't enjoy a fast food burger and fries. Sure. But it's certainly not the glamour that it is and the billboard and the, the, the television advertising. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. uh, totally. Uh, okay. And that's what we're finding in uh, the life insurance industry as well. We're seeing products being pushed, marketed, and I won't go as far as to say it's false marketing, but it's misleading. Mm -hmm. Because just like the misleading tobacco ads or the misleading information we were given throughout the, the pandemic, or the misleading representation of syrup being poured over pancakes or how wonderful that Big Mac looks on the <laughs> yeah. view or the golden fries or whatever it is, they never really live up to that in real life. And that's what's happening in the life insurance industry. They are marketing heavily a product that brings in lots of revenue and reduces their risk, and it's called universal life insurance. Yeah. And there's three different types of universal life insurance, and we're going to talk about one of them in specific because it is the one that is being really, really pushed right now by the industry because it's making them so much money, and it reduces their risk at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, there's 52 different insurance companies, last I checked, that are selling this type of life insurance. It's called indexed universal life insurance is the particular flavor that we're going to be talking about today. And so it it's, often it's is marketed as being better than whole life insurance, yeah, which is really team. comparing an apple and an orange. It is. So, John, you mentioned there's 52 companies selling this IUL insurance. Uh, what, what, what can we compare that to? How many? So, so how many companies would be selling participating whole life insurance? Would be you know if we're going to compare that, um, and how many of them that, that actually build strong cash value over time? There's just there's really just a handful of those companies. Well, I knew um, like 15 years ago there were around 22 companies that 22 were selling mutual insurance. Yeah, yeah. mutual mm -hmm. mutual whole life insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and we know there's not that many today. And even not all of those uh, companies have the kind that is going to 
build the high cash value like what we're looking for when, right. when we're designing whole life insurance policies to sell to our clients. Um, so, so that puts a little different perspective on, or helps us understand that 52, they're selling a lot more IUL. And why are they doing that rather than the whole life? I you suppose. just said IUL, Michelle, and we need to tell what IUL is. Oh, sure. Because we're we haven't using... really mentioned that word yet. We get in our insurance terminology yeah, here. Yeah, our insurance ease. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, IUL is a type of universal life insurance. It's indexed universal life insurance. And you want to explain to us what that indexed part means? Sure. Oftentimes it's called variable indexed universal life insurance or equity indexed universal life insurance. That's what it first came out as. And um, it it says that it's better than whole life. The marketing says it's better than whole life because you actually get a benefit from the market without having the risk of being in the market. And that's a little bit misleading because you're not really benefiting fully from the market because they put caps on what you can earn. And they also put floors, and then the floor they say, oh, well, even if the market doesn't return a positive interest rate this year, you can't lose mo- you can't lose interest. But that doesn't mean you can't lose money. Well, it sounds to me just a little bit like that one – a uh, jingle ad you said for tobacco wet ivory tips protect your lips. <laughs> so, so maybe that's what this index universal life is doing. It's kind of protecting you from the market, but it's yeah, maybe not. It's, what it's, it's is. not everything that it's cracked up to be. And there's a number of things that that uh, affect universal life insurance. Uh, with participating whole life insurance, the insurance company is taking the risk. Um, so they're they're going to guarantee that certain values are going to be there in the policy. With indexed uh, universal life insurance, uh, they may guarantee that you'll never earn less than 0%, you know, if the market was down that year, but they're not going to guarantee that the policy costs won't still be subtracted in those years. And so those uh, those policy costs can still be subtracted. Something else, you know, they, they'll market indexed universal life insurance as being flexible premiums. So, you know, don't have as much this year, you don't have to pay as much. You have more next year, you can pay more. The problem is, is that you always have an annual increasing cost of insurance Mm -hmm. that's always going to be coming out of that policy. So if you do end up just paying those minimum premiums, which often happens because human nature, you know, if if there is something minimum, you know, we're going to push those limits. Well, of course. (laughs) Uh, But if you have, if you just pay those minimum premiums, you were talking to an actuary some years ago, dad, uh, who said that, um, you know, if people just pay the minimum premiums, that means that an IUL product would, may have to earn like 10% every year in order for to avoid higher premiums in the future. And is that feasible? Is that really feasible? That's a great question. It's a question most people aren't asking. Well, a lot of, uh, of uh, large investment firms like Vanguard and Fidelity and such are saying that over the next decade, we're going to be doing good to be earning between 3 and 6%. Not ten percent, and so those are um, pretty far-fetched uh, um, problems that we're we're having to face. They sure are, and th- that three to six percent. If the market is doing three to six percent, you're not going to get all of that in the IUL contract because you're going to have costs and fees that come out of that. Because the insurance company is being that middleman for you. They they are giving you a floor. So if the market dropped, you know you wouldn't have less than a zero percent return from the market. But of course, you're still going to have those fees coming out, uh, whether the market is up or down. Well, let's talk about some of those fees. There's there's fees and charges, and there's a difference in an IUL product between the fees and the charges. The charges are just the cost of the insurance. And as you said, John, the cost of the insurance goes up regularly in an IUL product. And if you look at the IUL um, policy or illustration, it's going to tell you by month what it's going to cost per thousand dollars of coverage. Well, that's a little difficult to interpret, isn't it? Well, that's why the, you know, the, the Center for Economic Justice says that these IUL products are complex and are sold under false premises and deceptive marketing. It's very, very hard to understand for a layperson. It's hard enough for an agent sometimes to even understand oh, yeah. it. Uh, uh, we've talked to many agents that haven't a clue what they're selling because they can't justify the reasoning in these contracts. So... 
Um, but for a layperson to grasp, pick that up and say, oh, wow, how, what is this, you know? It, it, it's very hard to understand. So, 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 for example, when you're looking at an IUL illustration, you might look and when, when you go to the cost of insurance page, they might say 0. 0.2282 per thousand. Per month. So, okay. <laughs> and so, now so we've now, got another figure on that. Yes. <laughs> so now you've got to interpret that. How much is that actually going to cost per year? And so one policy that you, know, you recently reviewed, that cost of insurance was $356 um, and some odd cents per month. But 10 years later, it was $586 mm -hmm. and, and some odd cents per month. And, you know, if you look at that, that's, that was a 64% increase over those 10 years. You look 20 years out, it's going to be up 341%. That's over three times wow. the cost of insurance. You go out 30 years, it's going to be up over 11 times. You go out 40 years, it's going to be that cost of insurance is going to be up over 40 times. So let's just look at this. Why does the insurance company say it's going to cost 0.002885% or per, per thousand? It's because it looks like it's a very small number. Sure. But when you put the thousand per month, figure in there, that cost goes up. And it, just look at the percentage increase over the course of the contract. Yeah. Those charges or the cost of insurance is tremendous. Yeah. So that's like the beautiful motor oil that gets poured on the pancakes in the advertisement. When we're all thinking syrup, it's... It looks tiny on the page. And yeah. they're minimizing what appears to be the risk to the client yeah. or the prospect. And so, you know, if, if you know how to work with those percentages, you can use those percentages... Um, and figure out the true cost. But most people don't think in percent. So most people are going to just see a table of small decimal numbers, and they're not going to realize the, the actual costs that are associated with that. Now, here's the thing. The cost for whole life insurance or term is identical to what it costs for the coverage of insurance in an IUL product. But the difference is the insurance company gives you a guaranteed contract in a term saying, oh, if you buy term for 20 years, you can have this level premium for this time. You know exactly what the cost is going to be without going through all that arithmetic and trying to figure it out. In a whole life policy, the insurance company guarantees that the cost to you will never go up. So again, you already know exactly what it is. And of course, in a whole life product, we know that the reason the price can't go up is that you actually buy the death benefit, whereas in term and an in index universal life, you never buy the insurance, you're only renting it. Mm -hmm. And so those costs uh, hurt you a lot more in an IUL policy because you've got to come up with it. You've assumed that risk when you sign that contract. Yeah. All right, so I want to... Um... So those are charges. What about the fees, Michelle? Well, I know there's a lot of fees that can come out. And if you read an IUL illustration, it talks about this fee and that fee and the other fee. But of course, that's not shown on their, you know, in their calculations. It's just lots of fees that are. But in a whole life policy, there's a policy fee. A once, flat fee. A, a once a year flat policy fee. And it's figured into all their calculations. So you don't even see I mean, it, it's just underlying there. So it's there, but all the numbers are figured according to that fee. But but that kind of brings me back to what I wanted to do. Okay, so I wanted to just talk a minute about, we're talking about these guaranteed contracts. Well, what, what are these guarantees? And before a policy is issued, we can do an illustration showing what a policy would look like. And an illustration... Um, you know, if you've got a child's book and you've got the words, you also have an illustrator who drew the pictures. Well, when we have an illustration, it, there's writing words uh, telling about the policy, but there are also pictures um, and charts that give us the actual numbers. And there are guaranteed columns so we can see exactly what the our money is guaranteed to do. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about the guaranteed contract. There's also non-guaranteed numbers. And those are, oh, maybe this will happen, maybe it won't. In a whole life policy, those non-guaranteed numbers are based on dividends. But of course, which are based on the profits of the insurance company. Yes, those dividends are. So if the are, insurance company makes a profit, we get to share in that. Right, and then when when a dividend is declared, then that changes all those guaranteed values that we were seeing, mm -hmm. and they only increase. And and the that once it's increased, it can never be taken away. Now on the IUL, 
those non-guarantees are talking about, oh, this might happen in the market and here's what would happen if it's this good. And then usually they have an either even more non-guaranteed number that, and here's these numbers of what could happen. Right. But when we go back to the guarantees, in the whole life, we see that the death benefit is guaranteed to last the entire life of the, the insured, where when we look at those same guaranteed on an, an IUL policy, we see that those guarantees stop. They are either shown as going to zero, some companies say zero, and then some companies have the word lapse. Mm -hmm. And there's only, in an IUL illustration, oh, I don't know how many pages, uh, 40, It's a lot longer 60, than a whole life. Yeah, sometimes they're really yeah. long. There's only one or two pages that will show those guarantees. And so it's real easy to overlook because there's so much information and so many calculations and so many um, big numbers and small numbers. And so if you don't know what you're looking for, it's hard to find. Yeah. Well, you know... Uh, many of you know that we fly airplanes, and airplanes are known to burn a lot of oil and to leak a lot of oil. Well, when and you fly, you even carry some extra bottles of oil just you, in you case. You just do, <laughs> because airplane engines burn oil. And, you know, when we get in our automobile and we turn it on, we don't really necessarily think about the oil anymore because uh, the industry has done a very, very good job of making automobile engines, you know, pretty uh, oil tight. And all you have to do is kind of say, change your oil every 5,000 miles and, and you're good. But in an airplane, if you, if you don't carry that oil, you could be trapped someplace without enough oil. And the oil cools your engine in a, in a single engine airplane. And you can end up burning your engine up when you're up in the air. And that's real dangerous. Mm -hmm. So that's like the fees and the and the charges in an IUL policy, it gets burnt up in the process of just existing. And if you're not prepared to hit the target premium and not the minimal premium, then your policy is going to burn up mm. halfway through the course. You know, that's a really good example, Tom. And, and you're going to be wondering, what happened to my insurance coverage? What happened to all the money that I put there? I'm not going to get to my destination that I wanted to get to. And, and even if you do put the target premium in, that's no guarantee that your guaranteed values aren't going to decrease. That's exactly the, right. In the yes. later years of the contract. In fact, they probably will. You're going to be dependent more on those non-guaranteed values. And that's because that ever-increasing uh, cost of the insurance. And it, if even if somebody met the, that ever-increasing cost, then they would actually be paying more than the death benefit would pay out in the future because it's expensive. It is. And that's one of the things that's often marketed with IUL products as well is that you get both the death benefit and the cash value. Well, how can that happen? That's because you're not, they're acknowledging you're not building equity here. Mm -hmm. Okay, your cash value is not equity in the death benefit like it is in whole life insurance. You're always renting whatever that death, that extra death benefit is. And when that, that virtually guarantees that your cost of insurance is never going down. And so that's, so Overall, when you're paying yeah. premiums, like when you first start the policy, it doesn't take all that premium of course, to no. fund your death benefit. So then that extra money goes into that cash account. Mm -hmm. And so that's really overfunded premium that is sitting there to be used later or, you know, if there was a market increase, it would go into that cash account. So that's why you, if you were to pass in those early years, you, your beneficiaries get the death benefit and the money that was in that cash account. Mm -hmm. And then that brings up another fee with IUL products and that's the surrender fee. So let's say that you have a, a number of accumulated dollars in that cash value account. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you can get to all of them? It doesn't. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in the first 10 to 15 years, there's a surrender fee. In fact, is on all IUL policies for at least the first 10 years, sometimes as long as 15, there's a surrender fee. And that means you can only get a portion of that because the insurance companies want to make money. Mm -hmm. And so they're not going to give you all the extra premiums back you paid. So yeah. until after they have gotten to a place where they have avoided the risk of paying your death benefit. 
And that that's a big contrast from whole life insurance because in whole life insurance, we're, um, we're actually building equity in the policy from day one. And say, say you wanted to surrender your policy, then they will give you all the equity that you yeah. have in that policy. That's right. And there are costs that are going to be associated with that. It's kind of like starting up a new business, but you know what those costs are going to be ahead of time. And That's you know correct. They, those guarantees are not going down. The guarantees in a whole life policy always go up. That's important. That's very important because in the IUL, the guarantees do go down. In fact, is that is the guarantee in a whole life policy is that your cash values will equal your death benefit when the contract matures. That's right. That is not the guarantee in a universal life product, especially in an index universal product because they can't guarantee that because they put that responsibility back on the policy holder. That's right. So IUL products and whole life insurance products, they're both put into this bucket of permanent hmm. life insurance. Which is another marketing scheme, in my <laughs> opinion, because IUL is not something that we would associate with having permanency. Not at all. You know, when you think of something permanent, you think of longevity, of stability, of ownership. Uh, these are not things that uh, really apply to IUL. If you want permanence, you want something that builds equity, you're looking for whole life insurance and you want to stay away from that IUL insurance. You know, something that um, that is concerning to us is about the way that indexed universal life insurance is being marketed is we understand that participating whole life insurance has some excellent qualities that people can use it as a financial tool mm -hmm. during their lives and, you know, in retirement, they can use it. And, of course, then there's the death benefit whenever they pass away along that time that goes to their heirs. We understand the wonderful value in that. Uh, we see indexed universal life insurance products being marketed with some of the things that we've been talking about, the different uh, marketing messaging and uh, schemes that are used to push this. But we understand that that flexibility always comes with a cost. It's kind of like, you know, when you... Uh, when you spend the money on a credit card. You only have to make the minimum payment, but that flexibility <laughs> comes with a cost, oh, okay. a very high interest cost over time. That's a that's a good correlation, John. Yeah, um, I, I remember, I, I think I read that in one of your blogs here recently, Dad. Uh, you you used that uh, that analogy, and it is a wonderful analogy, that well, flexibility. Well, then, yes, Tom, that was a good analogy. <laughs> good yeah. correlation. Well, it's and just so, a fact. So Everybody yes. understands that. Yeah, so, so when we see this happening, in the life insurance industry, we know that indexed universal life insurance products, it's just a matter of time until they blow up. It is. And, yeah. you know, we see we see organizations <laughs> talking about this already. Forbes had an article on this recently. Uh, the Center for Economic Justice, you've mentioned that. And even the uh, National Association of Life Insurers is acknowledging that indexed universal life insurance isn't for everyone. There's, there's a lot of complexities that most people don't understand. This is going to blow up eventually. We know that. But the reason it's concerning for us is not that something bad is going to get is going to go away. I think that's a that's a good thing. But our concern is is that it's going to affect the reputation of the entire life insurance as a whole. And so many people will think that life insurance is no good at all. So we want to go on record explaining, you know, the differences between those products, not so that when IUL blows up, we can say, see, we told you so, but to set the record now that we, we understand that these type of products aren't going to be there for people. So focus on the products that do provide the long-term benefits that you can rely on, the products that are truly permanent. That's the message that we want uh, everyone to hear today. Yes. And then, of course, there's some listeners that we have here today that uh, may have IUL policies. And so we're here to try to throw out a lifeline to you, <laughs> if you will, that you can realize, oh, dear, if you have one of these policies, it, the guarantees aren't going to last. And when do you want to know that? Let's look at that now and see what you can do about it so that you're not stuck when the policy lapses or, or when the flexibility kicks in and now it's flexible payments that you need to come up with increased premium. And, you know, we want to get to that point. We want, it. we want it, you to be able to make a, an adjustment in the course you're going if while there's still time. Well, this goes right. back to what we were talking about at the very first of the, of the podcast here. You know, when a football player signs with the NFL, they know they have a high risk of coming away with a concussion or a spinal injury. And we've seen a lot of that happen this year. 
Um, but that's not a hidden yeah, the, fact. The, it, yeah, everybody they, knows about that. <laughs> yeah. Sure. The tobacco industry hid the fact that tobacco causes cancer to the public. That was wrong. And I think that what the insurance industry is doing is hiding the risks associated with universal products from the public. And I believe that's wrong. And we want people not to have any hidden factors involved in when they buy their policies. So we're not telling people what to do. We're just saying, hey, look, here's some things you might not have considered that, mm-hmm. are, that are facts that you need to know because it's an inherent risk that you're assuming and you may not know it. Mm-hmm. And we want you to be able to, hey, you could come away with a big headache from this product yeah. if yes. you don't understand these hidden factors. And um, so that's what we're here to help people understand. Totally. So, so just like we talked about earlier, there's an illustration that you can get before your sale, before you purchase a policy that shows exactly what the guarantees are in that law, those many, many pages. You can also, if you currently have a universal or index universal IUL policy, you can get what's called an enforce illustration and they prepare that illustration showing what the policy is doing right now. And it also shows those guarantees so you can see the lapse. So you don't have to just take our word for it. You can actually see this for yourself. That's right. And we, we can help you with those policy reviews. I'll tell you a little bit about what we do in a policy review. But before I do that, I also want to cover an example or, or a question that often comes up. People will say, well, you don't need life insurance for your whole life. Um, maybe you do just need it temporarily. That that's a marketing um, thing. <laughs> yeah. So so let's let's keep that in mind here. I do want to come to that. You know, if you want a policy review, you know, that's something we can help you with here at Life Benefits. You can request an enforce illustration. You can contact us. We're happy to look it over with you and show you these points. You know, where the guaranteed values are going to zero. What's involved in that. We can also show you what real permanent life insurance looks like. How that is designed and how it would work. Uh, for you as a financial tool. So you can call us at 702-660-7000. Now, let's go back real quick for a minute to that idea, well, what if you don't need life insurance for your whole life? Well, so many. this is not a new idea. This has been around since, uh, I think it was real popular in the 1970s and 80s. A.L. Williams said, buy term and invest the difference. It was popular before that because it used to just be term insurance. And the public demanded, no, we want something that lasts our whole life, that has equity in it. That's where whole life came from in the first place. Yeah. So term insurance, you know, everyone pretty much recognizes that that's temporary. Um, You're going to you're going to buy it for a certain amount of time. Premiums are going to go up after this time. Um, If you don't die within the level term period, you're not going to have the premiums that you paid for it. Okay, Uh, we can live with that. Um, But a lot of people still want insurance when that term period expires. And so that's where the permanent life insurance comes in. With uh, participating whole life insurance, a well-designed policy, you're going to pay a level premium for that every year, but it's going to build enough value. So if if a well-designed policy, you know, by 15 years in, you're going to pretty much see everything that you've paid in premium is there in cash value. And you know that cash value is always going up. So let's say that you did want to cancel the insurance at a certain point. You get back everything that you paid in premiums and more. So my death benefit didn't cost me anything over those 15 years? Exactly. If you plan long term for it, it should not. Now, let's look at uh, indexed universal life insurance. With those decreasing guaranteed values, there's no guarantee that you will have more in cash value if you went to surrender that policy, if you did decide you didn't need the insurance anymore, um, there's no guarantee that you're going to get your premiums back. Well, John, I have to talk about those uh, projected values in IUL again, too, because oftentimes, in fact, as every IUL illustration I've ever looked at has a chart that goes back 20 years and tells what these indexes have done, what mm-hmm. the Russell, what the S&P 500, what the uh, you know foreign indexes have done. And, and if you do this, then this is the average. But those numbers have been cherry-picked. In Sometimes. every illustration, they've been cherry-picked because they're usually going from January to December of each year. But what happens if you buy your contract in March? What happens if you contact her in June? I challenge the listeners to go and look at um, 
uh, uh, the S&P 500 index. You can Google it. It'll come up. It'll give you a little chart. And just play with the numbers for 20 years and put in different months. They don't actually have to play with years. the number for 20 years, do no. they? You just can look the Histo data. You look uh -huh. at the history. You can see ranges anywhere from 5 to you know, to 1% to 5% difference in what month that you start participating in that index. That is not included. That's why they're cherry-picked. Yeah, so, so that flexibility, that's another form of flexibility that doesn't always work out in your favor. Mm. It's uh, something that you cannot control. And so, you know, if you did want to get rid of a policy, you know, if, as long as you're planning to keep it, you know, at least 15 years, whole life insurance is probably going to give you uh, more cash value back um, unless you're depending on the market, those market returns. If you're just looking at guaranteed values, the whole life insurance is going to give you the most money back if you did decide to cancel. But if you decide to keep it, the best product, hands down, is participating whole life insurance because you know those guaranteed values are going to be going up every year and not decreasing the longer that you keep it, like with a universal life insurance. And let's say that I just get tired of paying premiums. So I'm, I really want to keep the product, but I just don't want to take premiums anymore. In a whole life policy, I have equity in that. So if I say I don't want to pay premiums anything, anything that I haven't purchased, anything that's not my equity disappears. I don't pay any more premiums. But my cash values keep growing because I didn't lose my equity. Right. And, of you course, my keep, equity keep the is equity. the death benefit that's been fully paid for. Exactly. That doesn't happen in an index product or a universal product because you never own anything. Yep. And so that's why, you know, if you're using life insurance for planning for your golden years, um, that's why whole life insurance is the product of choice again here because you know those guaranteed values are going to be going up. You can RPU a policy, which is stopping the premiums on it. RPU, that's another Reverse paid up. It's, it's an Re insurance reduced, term. Yeah. Reduced paid up policy. <laughs> yeah, so, so it means stopping the premiums on a policy, not paying those anymore. Um, and basically just giving up your, your unpurchased death benefit and keeping the death benefit that you have already purchased, this, the death benefit that you had the equity in. Mm -hmm. So you have that option. You could also convert it to an annuity to give you an income stream, and you have other options for, for how to use that in a whole life insurance policy. Whereas with index universal life, remember, those guaranteed values are going down the older you get because that ever-increasing cost of insurance. Well, and there's another way that we can use whole life insurance either for our golden years or not for our golden years, and that is really the living benefits and how we use a whole life insurance policy, the cash values in it during our lifetime. And I know our time is, we, we've really gone longer today. So we've been talking about the products today, but next time I'd really like to talk a little bit more about how we access and use those cash values because that's the exciting thing one of the exciting features of whole life insurance. And I think it would be fun to uh, get into that. What do you, what do you uh, think? Yes. You know, that, that is something you, you do not, um, you, we didn't really look at that today, but you get to use your whole life insurance value along the way. You do not have to wait until you're 59 and a half or to, until you're to retirement to access so many of the, the retirement plans that people I'll use for saving today. And that's the part that really got us excited and really brought us into this industry in the first place. So Tom, does that sound like a good idea for next week's discussion? Well, that's why we call ourselves life benefits. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's the living benefits of whole life insurance that um, motivate us and try to um, get us to help other people realize the, uh, the, financial peace and freedom that come from being able to manage money in a way that really beats the financial system that we have to live in in this world. That's right. So you can reach us at 702-660-7000, whether you need assistance with a policy review or whether you want to see what real permanent life insurance looks like designed so that you can use it as a financial tool during your lifetime and at all phases throughout your life. Uh, give us a call. That's what we're here to help you with. Again, the number 702-660-7000. You are listening to Wealth Talks with the McPhees. Have a wonderful week.